This week, the theme of our reflection is the prophet among his own. The readings of the liturgy invite us to reflect on the vocation of the prophet with particular focus on the exercise of the prophetic ministry within the context of one's own people. The prophetic ministry in its very essence is a ministry of the truth since it is a ministry of objectivity. Precisely because the prophet does not communicate his own view of reality, but God's own view. And God's view is objective because it is not limited by any perspective, since by definition, God is omnipresent and omniscient, not influenced or limited by space or time or circumstance. In this light, the perspective of a prophet should be a mediation of God's objective vantage point, uninfluenced by any interest whatsoever. Clearly, this kind of disinterested truth is often bitter and certainly not easy to communicate, especially to a people with whom the prophetic messenger shares affiliations of blood, religion, tribe, or nationality. In the first reading from Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 2 to 5, Ezekiel is sent to the people of his own nation. Characterized by the divine speaker as a nation of rebels whose fathers have defied the Lord and whose sons are brazen of face and stubborn of heart. The characterization of Israel as rebellious and stubborn is a common theme among the prophets. It underscores the nation's sinfulness and it constitutes the basis of divine punishment with the exile and the destruction of the temple. Ezekiel is given an inkling that his people are not likely to listen to him, but he must nonetheless speak the truth to them. As we read in verses 4 to 5, I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus said the Lord, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious breed, that they may know that there was a prophet among them. The expression, thus said the Lord, is considered as the messenger formula, indicating that the prophet is speaking as God's mouthpiece, thus in God's terms, not in his own terms. In the verses and chapters that follow, the prophet is continually reminded of the stubbornness of his own people, but he is also continually encouraged not to be afraid to speak the truth to them. Truth saves, as John chapter 8 verse 32 makes us understand, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Without truth, therefore, we would be living in enslaving illusions and in destruction destined falsehoods. If we speak truth to others that they may be set free, we are undertaking a salvific act of charity towards them. If so, these acts of charity should in fact begin at home. The bitter herbs of truth should not be reserved for only those against whom we nurse some disaffection. They are also medicinal to those of our own circles and affiliations and should be equally served them. In our second reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians chapter 12, Paul responds to his critics. He begins by referring in the third person to a vision in which he was taken up into the third heavens. He then distinguishes between that part of him taken up in a vision and the physical weak Paul. He will not boast about his visions, but instead of the weak person he is, he says, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except my weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 5 to prevent Paul from becoming proud of his visions and extraordinary revelations. He says that he was given a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat him. Two things to underscore there. A thorn in the flesh and an angel of Satan. First, the angel of Satan could be a way of saying God permitted Satan to torment or tempt him 
Read Job chapter 2 verse 7 or Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 24. God can allow Satan to torment the flesh to save the spirit for the day of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 5. There are speculations and different theories about the thorn in the flesh that Paul mentions here. The different views of scholars include, first, that it refers to the opponents fighting against Paul, those false apostles who were causing him great suffering. The second opinion is that a temptation of the flesh, which could relate to some sexual struggle. The third opinion is that it was a physical ailment, some pain in Paul's body. These are all speculations as we cannot precisely conclude what Paul meant. The most crucial point is that Paul had some form of weakness which was a pain to him, for which he prayed to the Lord three times. Each time God says to him, my grace is enough for you, my power is at its best in weakness. Harry's grace is that favorable attitude, kindness, favor, and helpfulness of God towards us. God's power shines upon our dark areas to reveal our human weaknesses and limitations. In other words, when one is weak, that is when he realizes the need to depend on God. Otherwise, pride set in. So Paul reaches this depth of truth and understands that he needs to depend totally on the power of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we should never be ashamed when we are weak or fall into sin, but rather see it as a springboard to greater dependency on the grace of God. Our weaknesses should not be obstacles to our preaching the gospel, but it should humble us to realize that other people may be experiencing other weaknesses just as we are weak. The Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 6 from verse 1 to 6. Jesus goes with his disciples to his native place of Nazareth in Galilee, where his people rejected him. This was not the first experience in his hometown. Nazareth is in Galilee in northern Israel, where Jesus lived and carried out his ministries as recorded in the first part of Mark's Gospel, that is Mark chapter 1 to chapter 10. The second part, Mark chapter 11 to chapter 16, records Jesus' activities in Jerusalem in Judea, located in southern Israel. So, although Jesus was born in the south, in Bethlehem of Judah, he grew up in the north, in Nazareth of Galilee. After Jesus left Nazareth in Mark chapter 1 verse 9 to be baptized by John in the Jordan, he went about preaching all around Galilee. He chose his disciples, he performed many miracles, and his fame spread throughout the region of Galilee. However, when he went back home in Mark chapter 3 from verse 20 to 35, he received a cold welcome and he was accused of casting out demons with the power of Beelzebul. So again, Jesus goes out and he teaches and performs miracles and exorcisms such that large crowd followed him. Yet again, when he returned home today, the people questioned his wisdom and power, insulting him as the carpenter's son and as Mary's son, and they took offense at him. The imperfect passive, escandalizonto, translated as to take offense, is from the verb scandalizo where we get the English word scandal or to scandalize and it means to cause to stumble or to sin or to fall away from faith. The people allowed their familiarity with Jesus and his origin to cause them to stumble and to fall from faith, seeing him not as the prophet he is, but as a carpenter. Jesus knows that Jeremiah was rejected by his people and family in Jeremiah chapter 12 from verse 5 to 6. And Ezekiel, in today's first reading, was sent to his stubborn people who will not listen to him. Ezekiel chapter 2. For this, he reminded them of a common rabbinic proverb. A prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. Jesus, therefore, amazed at their lack of faith, could not perform mighty deeds there except curing a few sick people. He, however, moved to the villages around to continue his teaching. Faith 
my dear friends, is the key that unlocks closed doors. For without faith, we can do nothing. Whether we are honored, appreciated, respected, or rejected even by those we affiliate closely with, God wants us to keep working and spreading the good news. The imperfect nature of the church members does not in any way nullify God's message through his church. Therefore, let us pray that God may heal our unbelief, especially those caused by wrong perceptions, that we may be filled with faith to witness his mighty works in our lives and in our world. May God bless us all. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening and may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page, Devar Adonai, or visit our website, devaradonai.org.